Well, John and Gary, thank you so much for joining uh, me here. I'm Sakshi Singh Latoria and we are chatting on CNN News 18. My first question is for Gary. Gary, since you are a CIA agent yourself, in order to, you know, qualify yourself as a CIA agent, what kind of a physical and mental training one needs to go through? But so before I was CIA, I was special operations in uh, the U.S. military. Right. So the mental and physical preparation was greater for that. I think to be in the CIA, uh, first you have to have a personality that allows you to keep secrets, right? <laughs> and some people are, are not wired that way. Um, second, to be a, an operations officer, someone that goes out to run spies, recruit spies, uh, live in foreign countries undercover, that takes sort of a different um, mindset personality because there's a lot of mental stress. You always know that your, you know, certain countries are going to try to find you or that the host nation country may put surveillance on you and follow you. So it's it, it puts a lot of stress on you. And I believe that you need techniques to learn how to relax, to learn how to calm yourself. And it helps to have uh, physical activity, some sort of exercise to help relieve that stress. Otherwise, when you're under stress for too many months uh, continuously, you'll, your body and your mind will start having right. problems. Right. John, coming to you. You, this is not your first time making any documentary. You have made such documentary series in the past as well. What kind of a research is required as far as the angle finding is also concerned? How do you find people who are actually allowing you to take their bites also to reveal their identity there? Thanks, Saksi. Um, our, our company has been producing uh, documentaries for about 15 years about really important subjects uh, ranging from science to military history, terrorism. And uh, approximately a decade ago, we realized there were not uh, so many um, uh, factual documentaries being made about CIA and other uh, countries' intelligence services. So we decided to look into that a little bit further. And we found that in order to make a series in, uh, work in this genre, first of all, it had to be interesting to the viewers. So um, it has to be a story that has global impact or that uh, people uh, from around the world, you know, this story would resonate with them. Second, we have to be able to find the people who are actually directly involved. Because for stories like this, for them to be powerful, you need to have people speaking in the first person. So we want people talking about how they were there, what they did, not what others did, what they actually did. And third of all, they have to have permission to speak about the operation. So only when those three things line up, uh, can you make uh, an effective episode? And uh, that's what we did with all eight episodes of Spy Ops. Interesting. Coming back to you, Gary, I want to talk to you about uh, the certain terminology you used in your episode, which is episode number seven of Spy Ops. I want to talk about you, the passage to Taliban that you talked about. What exactly is passage to Taliban? Also, since you spent a considerable amount of time there in Afghanistan, what kind of a research did you do about their food, their language, their habitat as well? I had lived and worked in the Middle East for several years before as a military person. Um, so I had experience with um, Islam. I knew a lot of details of differences between Sunni and Shia. Then after we got in Afghanistan, you know, you're li I lived my in 2001 and two, I lived with villagers and fought with villagers. So you, I learned their tribal codes, how to act when you're sitting around tribes, people. Uh, yeah, I did some study in books, but most of mine was in person. And we saw um, in the, our episode with Rasul, the linguist, with all the linguists who were all native Afghan, they were able to answer my questions about how the tribal codes worked and details um, that helped me navigate that those cultural differences. Right. 
John, my next question is for you. As we were talking about the research that is, uh, you know, being done for all the documentary series that you actually make, what do you have to tell us about the elements that you find out? What kind of a research do you put there? Also, as far as the angle find is in concern, how do you, you know, sort of find those angles that exactly fit uh, into the puzzle like a block? We, we have a really skilled production team, uh, very creative, great storytellers, and their job is to take uh, a story that's given to us in fragments and create one linear, cohesive story. And this takes uh, real creativity, uh, and it also takes great advice uh, and guidance from from people like Gary, who are you know the 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 most incredible people doing the most incredible things, but they're also restricted by how much they can share with us. So it's a careful uh, a careful formula of them uh, getting approval of very specific things they can and cannot talk about, sharing those with us, and then us turning it into compelling story that does not appear to have any holes in it. So we do that through uh, direct interviews and also archival footage uh, from news sources uh, who were covering the events in the past, and then uh, dramatic recreations of what uh, what it might have looked like when they were actually doing these things. Gary, coming back to you, in your episode, you also talked about uh, the incident that happened there, the embassy, the suicide bombing case that happened outside the U.S. embassy. I want to understand from you what exactly transpired there. How did you feel when you were there and the bomb blast suddenly happened? What went through your mind? Also, there is a journalist angle there in your episode that you just mentioned. You sort of played a part as a journalist there in your brief time in Afghanistan. Could you tell us more about that? Let's talk about the, the bombing outside the embassy first, okay? Um, yeah. I wanted to meet someone as a as a intelligence officer. Your job is to meet people, talk to them, see if they have any information that can help us, and then you know try to develop a relationship so they will give you that information. So I was going to meet somebody at a corner, and yeah, it was against the rules because officers aren't allowed on foot out out outside. You have to have uh, protective equipment, being an armored car, but I sometimes didn't follow all the rules, and that was one of those cases. Um, so we're at this very busy intersection, and and when you're out somewhere, we have what we call situational awareness, where you're looking, you're looking far, you're looking close, you're looking for threats uh, to come up that might try to approach you, and I kept seeing that car and. And it just bothered me. And I wondered, well, why is the car there? There's two guys in it. They're looking at me. I'm looking at them. But then, you know, I thought, oh, okay, I'm busy. And I looked somewhere else. And then a, a minute or so later, I look back and wonder, why is that car bothering me? Um, and, you know, then eventually the guy showed up. And when he showed up, we turned around, Rasul and I turned around and went back uh, to the security area and then into the embassy compound and that's when uh, when the bomb blew up and it was those two guys and i i guess just as we walked away a u.s military convoy was coming to that intersection and they blew themselves up right there where we were standing um and killed a couple u.s servicemen John, as far as the collection of the information is concerned, I think that, uh, you know, keeping your uh, uh, sources intact and the information that you have gathered so far is a spy operation itself. How difficult is it to keep everything at one place and that too safe? And how competitive is the documentary, uh, documentary making stream is? So for, for all the stories that we're uh, talking about, these are uh, cleared for publication, um, and the, the most of the people we're interviewing, um, first first of all, they all have permission to participate in the series, um, so we don't need to keep their identities secret, um, but we do protect information uh, about where and when we will be conducting interviews, because some of these people 
um, may have uh, security concerns. So uh, we, we will keep the information uh, tightly compartmented um, about where and when the interviews will take place. And sometimes we are interviewing people uh, who are adversaries to the United States. Uh, and we, we did some of that in spy ops. We interviewed some people in Afghanistan. We interviewed the person who shot the Pope. And these people were very concerned about security. So in those cases, we will sometimes use a local crew. Uh, we will provide them with the questions. Uh, they will arrange the interview locally in Afghanistan, record the interview, and then send the footage back to us. Um, so each person involved in the series uh, manages some of their own security. But for us, um, we're just trying to keep the information as secure as possible. And we rarely need to provide uh, physical security for any of our interview um, locations, but sometimes we do have to do that. So we're we're working on a few projects now. Um, one of them will premiere uh, on a major network in the United States first uh, next summer um, about uh, documenting uh, what it takes to become uh, a, a professional at CIA, uh, going behind the scenes for the first time. Uh, it will be a, a groundbreaking series, and um, uh, that will roll out worldwide uh, later next summer. But we always have great projects in the works. And as I mentioned, our production team is incredible, our creative team, amazing. And uh, thanks to uh, great people like Gary and the other people in the series who trust us to tell their stories, uh, we don't think we'll have any shortage of uh, uh, great television uh, for the for the foreseeable future. Gary, I just have two more questions for you. My first question is again, it's always difficult to, you know, keep your sources intact. There is always a threat of your friend becoming your foe when you are in a foreign country, especially that too, uh, in a country like Afghanistan. What kind of a threat you felt when you were there in Afghanistan? How difficult was it to trust somebody with your life when you spent your time there in Afghanistan, dealing with Taliban also, with Baghdad there? Uh, I also want to ask you something about, because Pakistan is our direct neighbor, and we are indulged in a lot of tussle with uh, them very often. I want to understand from you, what role did Pakistan play here? Did they provide any safe haven or a passage to these people who are conducting mischievous activities there in Af Afghanistan? So, you, friends is, is a loose word. Right? When I was there in 2001 and two, we didn't have time to figure out the warlords that we worked with and the soldiers. We knew that there were people in there that would just as soon be cooperating with Al Qaeda if they got money um, than us. So, but you were armed, you're well trained, you 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 know how to shoot your way out of problems, to walk out of problems, how to sense. Um, you know, several times I sensed that we were getting ready to be attacked, um, and we were able to take corrective action. And then when you're undercover and working, you never really make great friends. And you always understand that, you know, and my country may change its mind. And the person that's my friend or that I'm working with today may not be on the U.S. good side tomorrow. And it's hard on you as an individual, but you have to accept that what's right for your country and, and carry out those orders. With regards to my opinion as to Pakistan's role, yeah, I'm one of those people that I, I, I certainly believe that uh, Pakistan gave passage to uh, Taliban, tolerated Taliban, uh, to some extent tolerated Al Qaeda. Were they actively assisting them? I, I do not have any proof of that. Um, I would say for sure, I believe they turned a blind eye to the activities and that there's an old saying that the an enemy of my enemy is my friend. And I, I believe that as anything that kept Afghanistan off balance, they viewed as, as a, a positive for them. So yeah, I believe they had safe haven um, anytime I, you wanted to try to track somebody down, 
you had that issue of the Pakistan border. So that's my personal opinion. Gary, how would you describe the rise of Taliban and how would you compare the situation, the current situation with the situation which was there when you were there in Afghanistan? Again, there, there is no national identity in Afghanistan. It's ethnic and tribal. So some national movement that's going to overthrow the Taliban, I don't see that. We have the resistance um, now in the north that is probably going to become the most credible um, uh, counterbalance to the Taliban. But Taliban rule, when maybe at first people welcome them because they end some of the corruption that existed, but they always end up with their own corruption, at least in the past. And their very harsh rule, the treatment of women, those things eventually the society and even out to the tribal level become fed up with that, become tired of that. And then the Taliban will eventually have problems maintaining control. But I really apologize that I'll have to leave the conversation there because of the paucity of time. But John and Gary, thank you so much for joining me here on a quick chat on CNN News 18. It was a lovely conversation, surely an enlightening one as well. Thank you.